Now, those three of you that have seen the few videos we've put out so far are probably expecting another run-of-the-mill, garbage, poorly made movie from the late 50s or early 60s that I'm going to barely cover the plot of whilst attempting to make fun of it. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Today we'll be covering a movie that I actually loved. It's a very strange premise that's done in a very interesting way, and it absolutely nailed it. I speak, of course, of the horror, comedy, action, cop movie classic, Dead Heat. This movie is awesome. It's got humor, action, weird stuff, everything a connoisseur of crap like myself could ask for. This movie is beautiful with a capital B, you know, for B movie. Don't believe me? Well, allow me to convince you. Friendly warning. This movie's a little bit more crass than the last few we've done, so take that under advisement. The movie starts like the way any good movie should, with two people who look like the stupidest people you know getting ready to rob a bank. They bust in with leather masks, a bold choice for what looks like a summer month, and immediately start with the cliches, like trying to bust open the jewelry case. And here's where the humor begins. You idiot! Ah! Now that's funny. Cut to our two heroes, Doug Bigelow, who I assume is the inspiration for the Rob Schneider Deuce Bigelow movies, and Roger Mortis, whose name is like, Rigor Mortis. Get it? Exchanging some witty banter. You are going undercover. Yes. Roger is the tight, by the book, working stiff police officer, and Doug is the crass, rude, loose cannon type. Remember that. Or don't. I don't care. You can tell this movie is good because this time I actually remembered the two lead characters' names. They're police officers and get the call about the robbery and spring into action. 11 in progress at Melrose Place. Proceed immediately. You didn't say may I? Arriving at the scene, the police get ready to, in typical action movie fashion, arrest, and I use that word loosely, the perpetrators. So begins one of the most epic shootouts ever recorded on film. Bullets flying left and right, the perps are taking shot after shot and not going down. My words don't do it justice. Just watch. <laughs> Through some quick thinking and nice shooting, the perps get exploded and compressed, compounded, one of them gets hit by a car. This of course leads to another classic scene, getting yelled at by the police chief. Disrespectful conduct, flippant and tasteless verbal remarks. That was me. Our two heroes bond over this and why they chose to be cops. I love this job, Roger. I love the power, I love the little badges. I love being a human target for anyone within sniping range of a donut shop. And go to their office to discuss the recent string of robberies. However, they're interrupted by a call from their friendly neighborhood coroner. It's Smithers, I've got something for you. Get down to the morgue as fast as you can. She says there's something weird about the corpses. That is, the fact that they have autopsy scars. But I noticed one thing. What? You can see where the cut was made, traversing the sternum and incised with an electric saw. They had surgery? Nope. They had autopsies. I don't know much about autopsies, but I'm fairly certain you don't walk away from them. The head coroner shares this sentiment. The head coroner is played by Darren McGavin, who starred in a fantastic TV show called The Night Stalker, which is also how I'll be referring to him for the rest of the video. Roger and Doug get a lead from the bodies, leading them to Dante Pharmaceuticals and a woman named Randy James, who shows them around, using his sly detective skills. Uh, you know, Miss James, I gotta take a leak so bad my teeth are floating. Is there a little boys room around here? I just... Doug finds a weird-looking room that was probably used for an episode of Star Trek and accidentally wakes up, uh, I have no idea. Its face looks like if you took two heads and stitched them together, but its body makes it look like it ate three people. Maybe it did. After hearing Doug start to fight the PBZ, Roger springs into action, and what follows is another somewhat well-done fight scene between two men and a god knows what. What is this thing? Very ugly! Unfortunately, Roger is thrown into the decompression chamber, and I'd like to take a minute to talk about this thing. I don't know if this actually exists, and I have my doubts as to its scientific accuracy, but it really is handy for getting rid of pesky detectives, as a mysterious gloved hand activates the suffocation protocols. Roger unfortunately suffocates, and Doug is distraught. Luckily, Lady Corner goes to investigate the Star Trek room with Doug, and somehow she figures out how that machine can bring back the dead. Similar to the way starfish regrow limbs. I'll let her explain. It doesn't matter, Doug. Someone has found a way to revitalize dead tissue, the way a starfish grows new limbs. They put Roger in the machine, and the second worst effect in the movie occurs. Stock lightning over poor Roger convulsing. Somehow, Roger springs back up like a Pop-Tart that's done cooking, and after a brief discussion, realizes he doesn't remember dying. Not only that, but he doesn't have a heartbeat. Oh my god. What is it? I'm not getting a heartbeat. Big whoop, though. I don't have one either, and I'm just fine. 
Roger also cuts himself, and instead of blood flowing out, he sparkles like a twilight vampire. This is enough to convince Roger that he kicked the bucket, and he and Doug set out to find his murderer. But not before receiving the warning that within 12 hours, he'll turn into soup because his cells will melt. I've got 10 to 12 hours, tops. And then what? All of the cells of your body will dissolve into a kind of organic stew. They decide to take a visit to Randy's house, but first stop at a drugstore, because Roger's already started experiencing a little Roger Mortis. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant rigor mortis. This is the part of the movie that I really enjoy. Over the course of the film, they actually show him decaying, which most movies would hand wave away, changing once in the final scene. It's the little details like the color draining from his face over time that just warms what's left of my cold dead heart. After arriving at Randy's house, they catch her trying to skip town. It looks like the lady's going somewhere. Extra panties. Dead giveaway. And start to interrogate her. They find a tape where another celebrity, Vincent Price, is shown to be on his deathbed, explaining something or other. Once again, I give the effects team credit here, as although it is one of Mr. Price's last films before dying, I literally thought he was gonna die while filming. It looks like he's on his deathbed. Well done. While watching this tape, the group is ambushed by some assassins who appear to be past their expiration date. Another action scene takes place, with three crucial details being revealed. One, apparently you can stab these guys to death if you try hard enough. Two, you can 100% electrocute them to death, which doesn't play into the rest of the movie at all. And three, that Roger isn't breathing, which, yeah, he's dead. We're underwater in that jacuzzi for five straight minutes. That's right, I was. Did you teach my girlfriend how to do that? Roger takes a couple shots, but since he can't die, he's fine. He goes to change, though, and has a brief scene of him as a skeleton, and again with some more decay as his hair starts to fall out. Such a good movie, I'm telling you. Randy informs them that she delivered a shipment of a drug to a shop in Chinatown, so our heroes head there next, with of course some more witty banter. How many tickets is that this month so far? I mean. What the hell do you care? Good point. They meet a butcher slash sumo wrestler who is actually a professional wrestler named Professor Tanaka. That's not relevant, but it is a cool fact. The boss of the shop comes out and after a brief discussion, he rushes out, but not before causing the mother of all distractions, which is my favorite scene in the movie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the little china shop of horrors. Look at this. The idea that someone who's been tampering with bringing back dead tissues, which set a trap using the most unassuming dead tissues, that of animals in a butcher shop, is such a fantastic idea. More zombie movies should have scenes like this. You'd think that watching this would put me off meat, but it's actually just made me hungry. Very hungry. Anyway, they escape the trap, search the place, find a clue, and it's off to the library. On the way, you know we're gonna get more witty banter. You're quite the seamstress. Just hope it doesn't get infected. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll take my chances. Honestly, you should just watch this movie. It's funnier than I'll ever be. At the library, Roger has both an epiphany and an existential crisis, which is pretty standard behavior when you're in a library. Doug calms him down, and they swing by the crime lab as they realize he's starting to look a little worse. Lady Corner gives him a checkup, and they get into a fight, because they're in love. But this movie is about death, not love, so he leaves. But not before some witty banter with Night Stalker occurs, obviously. A little early for your postmortem, aren't you, detective? Just stop by to reserve a body bag. Doug goes back to Randy's place to do a little more investigative work, while Roger and Randy investigate Vincent Price's grave. Of course, more banter ensues. Allow me. Isn't that illegal? Yeah. While investigating the tomb, they obviously find some clues, but while watching, I found myself more concerned with the fact that this mausoleum has a phone and a lamp and things like that in it. Now I'm not rich or dead, so I don't really understand how mausoleums work. Is this standard procedure? And yeah, probably. Rich people are crazy. They get back to their house and make a startling discovery. Doug has unfortunately failed his high diving attempt and is also doing a really bad Mysterio impression. Roger sees to Doug and then goes to Randy, who's attempting to take a shower. Worry not, viewer, as instead of anything happening that my editor would have to cut out, we instead get the reveal that Randy is a zombie too, and she's decaying right before our very eyes. This is another great scene. Everything else in this scene is fantastic, but that face just sticks out like a sore thumb. Or a rotten thumb, I should say. Roger connects the dots and realizes Night Stalker is behind this whole shebang. He runs to confront him, but is ambushed by Dr. Fu Manchu. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Frankenshala. I mean, uh, Frankenstein. He's locked in an ambulance with the corpse of Lady Coroner, and the bad guys leave. However, using the fact that he's dead to his advantage yet again, he manages to get the ambulance rolling down a hill, crashing it into a fiery explosion. The end. <laughs> nah. He gets up, 
looking not too much worse for wear, surprisingly. I mean, compared to before the crash. He commandeers a bike and it's off to the races. While this is going on, we find out that Vincent Price is, in fact, alive. He's giving a speech to some rich people about how they can live forever. As you will see, ladies and gentlemen, the demonstration that you are about to witness makes burial somewhat unnecessary. And it's really convincing. Uh, I'd listen to it. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if Vincent Price was actually still alive. I wonder if they can actually bring them back. All the other zombies were subject to decay, except for Randy because she was special or something. It would suck to pay this exorbitant amount of money, then to decay in what I can only imagine is the worst way to die a mere 12 hours later. This is one big pyramid scheme. Roger arrives and pulls a ripoff of the police station scene from Terminator. <laughs> He breaks in and threatens the rich people out of the room and confronts the Night Stalker. However, Night Stalker's plan for this, and the body laying on the table is none other than Doug. Unfortunately, Doug's been dead a little too long, and brain damage has set in, making him even more mindless than he was before. Luckily, the power of friendship is stronger than that of brain damage, and Roger gets through to Doug, and the two of them confront Night Stalker, who decides to take the easy way out rather than see what those two have in store for him. You're gonna take me. But Roger and Doug aren't going to let something as trivial as death stop their quest for revenge. Despite pleading from Price, the duo decide to destroy the machine rather than work with Price to try to fix them, and the two of them walk off into their happily ever afterlife. But not before we get some final witty banter to play us out. I've seen meatloaf that looks better than you. You're not exactly a forest lawn poster child yourself, Doug. Hey, Roger, you think we'll be reincarnated? As what? I don't know, maybe you get a choice. You can be whatever you want. Oh, you mean like a statesman or a president or a prize-winning novelist? Personally, I'd like to come back as the seat on a girl's bike. At last, we've reached the cooling point of Dead Heat. This movie is what that R.I.P.D. movie that has Ryan Reynolds in it should have been. I mean, I like that movie too, but that's a story for another day. I unironically loved this movie. It's got great ideas, it's executed well, with just enough blatant cheesiness that you can laugh along with the movie. It doesn't take itself too seriously, yet it still has heart. Yet somehow this movie only has an 11% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's inexcusable. I cannot recommend this movie enough, and my words fail to do it justice. Go watch this movie for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's free on the Tubi streaming service. That's T-U-B-I. Be sure to come back next time when we'll get back to the status quo and cover a movie I didn't enjoy watching. Thank you very much, and remember, Weird Flicks watches what no one else will. Just an ordinary guy.